Hi, my name is Mike Fiffick, and I'm the managing member of Fiffick Law Group, the Legal Shield Provider Law Firm located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I'm here to talk to you today about a couple of different topics. Um, and my, the title of my presentation is, is Blockchain the Savior of Free Speech? And this is going to cover largely the, um, the, the fact that much of our lives, much, many of our assets are now transitioned into the digital world and how um, the digital world can be very effective in, in, in impact uh, free speech and the rights of free speech that are uh, so prevalent uh, today. So let's start off by talking about a cautionary tale relating to digital assets to sort of set the stage uh, for how important digital assets are and how important it is for you to be paying attention to digital assets, especially as it relates to putting together your estate plan. And the cautionary tale involves Leonard Bernstein, the very famous uh, composer uh, many, for many, many years. And Bernstein, about two years before his death, uh, began to write an autobiography, uh, which spanned his 50 years as a composer and orchestrator and conductor. And he chose to write that on his laptop. Um, that had really replaced the paper and pencil by that time. And this was in 1988. So it was quite some time ago that he started to do this. Um, the, the name of the autobiography was thought to be Blue Ink. And the fate of the Blue Ink autobiography really provides a, a cautionary tale for the digital age and uh, where a, a, a lack of advanced planning can really uh, result in the loss of valuable assets. So um, just setting the stage for that, that's a little teaser. We're going to come back to what happened, you know, what the fate of the Blue Ink autobiography was a little bit later in our presentation. But first, let's just talk a little bit about what are digital assets. And when uh, I mentioned digital assets, sometimes people think that that only means something like cryptocurrency or bitcoins. That's what they're thinking about. But really, that is uh, a real Bitcoin, if you're just limiting to that, um, that doesn't really capture what that is. So digital assets are literally um, any information or data that's stored electronically, whether it's on a device, online, um, or in a digital wallet, or in the cloud. So many things are in the cloud anymore these days. And so devices would include your smartphone, laptops, uh, tablets, cameras, flash drives, e-readers, uh, so many of the digital assets that uh, we've gotten used to having and really can't do, uh, do without you know, in this day and age. And on average, um, the personal, the an average device has over 3,000 personal digital files. And so uh, think about how many digital files there are available in all of your accounts. And that really would add up to a pretty huge inventory of digital assets some important, uh, some unimportant, but some vitally important. And so this next graphic gives you an idea of the scope of things that might be in your own personal digital asset inventory. Uh, think about your email accounts. Some of us have two or three or more email accounts that have thousands of emails in them, perhaps with documents or pictures attached to them. So really the volume of digital files that are in any one email account is really an overwhelming number. Uh, most of us use social media. Um, we'll see a little bit later how many social media accounts are owned on average. Uh, but there are there's tons of information available about us on our social media accounts. We have digital storage devices like Dropbox, iCloud, Google Drive, uh, many other uh, storage uh, spaces or uh, digital storage places where we put documents. Um, there are so many different examples of these things, but things that just um, come to us in our daily lives, like online shopping, right? Those are, that's information about you that you can access. And perhaps you have credits or points um, with rewards, points, accounts, things of that nature. Um, maybe if you're running a small business, you certainly have digital assets. Uh, for a small business 
such as your website, your social media accounts, your blog, um, uh, all of that information. You know, if you have a web hosting service, if you have a website, you must have a web hosting service. They're really the repository in the cloud of all of the digital files that appear or can be accessed via your website. Uh, we all, almost all of us have streaming services. Uh, those are accounts or digital accounts that we have, uh, eBooks, photos, family photos. Uh, the day of the uh, photo book or photo album is really gone, right? Nobody sees those anymore. We all have those pictures on our phone or perhaps we save them um, into the cloud into a Shutterfly or Flickr account or something. But, you know, those are often very cherished uh, family memories that are stored up there um, in some kind of a device. Um, and then it would also include digital or virtual currency, digital currency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, those different types of digital assets or cryptocurrencies that are available out there, those certainly are uh, digital assets. And so like it or not, um, there's really been a growing prevalence of digital assets. Um, and I think you probably all are aware of this. And you know, I want you to sort of come to grips with the fact that um, you've got a lot of digital assets out there. You might have known that intuitively, but not really sat down to think about um, the sheer volume of digital assets that you own. And then the next thing that you have to do is sort of wrap your mind around um, the fact that if you're going to do any type of estate planning where you are basically creating a roadmap for the um, handling, administration, and distribution of your assets after you pass away, to, uh, oftentimes to your family, um, that plan is going to have to include or incorporate the, all, this huge volume of digital assets that you already have created and that you will continue to create in the future, in, into the future. So here are just a few statistics for you. You know, eight in 10 Americans are on social media, and that's been a 75% increase since 2014, and it will uh, continue at a year-over-year -year growth rate of 13%. And on average, uh, we all have a little over eight social media accounts of some kind or another. Social media meaning Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Reddit, you know, all of those various social media accounts that are you know, out there. And then if you think about all of the other digital accounts that you may have, the average American user has about 150 online accounts that require some type of a, of a password in order to, to access them. So it's a huge number of digital assets. Uh, I found this st statistic um, about the dollar value, to put a dollar value on the digital assets. And the average is about $55,000 is what they're worth. Um, that could be comprised of uh, cryptocurrency assets that you have. Maybe it is money that you have in your Venmo or Cash App account. It could be the value of your reward points. You know, if you take a look at the, whole, the broad scope of digital assets and accounts that you have, I think you'd quickly realize that there is quite a bit of dollar value tied up in all of those accounts, or maybe dollar value tied up in accounts that are lost to you or your family. Some of them you can't even um, you can't even really value, right? If um, your family, if you have pictures and they're all of a sudden lost to your family, you know that might be a very terrible situation that uh, you can't put a dollar value. Um, 70% of people think that digital payment uh, forms or methods are going to overtake cash by 2030. 2030 will be here before you know it. And the United States is getting ready to issue digital currency. There's been several articles in the news in 2022 about the uh, country's uh, intent to issue digital currency. I think we all know it's already here and it's going to be coming. And sooner or later, it will probably replace hard currency. Um, you know, as the, as the primary form of payment. And um, so there's a lot of money tied up in your, uh, in your digital assets. Cryptocurrency is growing like crazy too. Although crypto investors recently have taken pretty much a beating uh, in the markets, but crypto is not going away. Um, the number of crypto wallets worldwide increased 45% from January of 2020 to January of 2020, uh, one. That's in one year, increased by 45%. And there are an estimated 66 million 
uh, crypto wallets worldwide. And uh, 21.2 million Americans own cryptocurrency of some kind or another. And it's going to continue to grow at that pace year over year. Uh, I would not expect uh, cryptocurrency to uh, go away anytime soon. And uh, as we will cover um, in the connection between cryptocurrency and First, First Amendment, I think you'll realize why cryptocurrency isn't going away um, anytime soon. So let's sort of switch gears a little bit and take a, a side, uh, a side uh, path uh, talking about free speech and the connection between digital assets and free speech. So the protections afforded to free speech in the First Amendment have long been considered you know, the bedrock of American democracy. And if you've watched the news even a little bit, uh, you will realize that the, the First Amendment topics are in the news you know, almost every night. And the digital world, I think many would say, was expected to be a forum of unregulated free speech. And perhaps you think that it already is a form of unregulated free speech, but there certainly have been arguments about whether it's unregulated or not. Certainly Donald Trump would say it's not unregulated since he's been banned from uh, Twitter. And uh, there've been other uh, instances of censorship. So the digital era, the, digitiz the digitization or digitalization of our lives is challenging the way we think about free speech. You know, in recent years, there's been growing disillusionment with this idea due to the rising issues of hate speech, um, disinformation on social media, so widespread censorship uh, on uh, of um, in the in the digital world by the government. Um, certainly, many governments uh, censor the um, the the digital communication, right? Digital speech. Russia, right, is is blocking any type of news about its war in Ukraine. Um, so it's censoring. China widely censors uh, the internet. So, and some might say that our government censors the internet too. Um, certainly there are private industries that censor um, or do some form of censorship. You know, there we do see that our private social media companies are um, taking down uh, posts or not allowing certain types of advertisers on their platforms um, that's happening uh, more and more frequently. And social media companies are really trying to come to grips with, you know, what's their role in regulating the, the type and content of speech that are on their platforms, really? Are they just a provider for the platform? And that's really the end of their responsibilities in that regard? Or do they have some level of responsibility to regulate the speech that is on their uh, platforms? Then we also have problems of data harvesting um, and surveillance. Uh, certainly, that's an issue that um, is coming up uh, in the wake of the uh, Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe versus Wade. And uh, there are now concerns that state governments might data harvest information about people who are in their states who are uh, seeking out information about um, ways to get abortion. You know, that, that type of stuff. So there are concerns about that kind of a thing. So we've really come to uh, realize that there's this tremendous gatekeeping power that social media companies have um, over our system of free expression. Um, and also the fact that many of these companies were really, really unequipped uh, to act um, as those kinds of gatekeepers, whether we call them monitors or censors. Uh, I think we can probably all agree that you know, if you think that hate speech, you know, there's, I think we can all agree that there's a ton of hate speech out there on the internet, out there in social media. There's a ton of disinformation on social media. Um, the, those types of things are just not pretty about the internet. And I, it's really sort of exploded over the last four or five years. And I think the social media companies have really been taken aback and it's overwhelmed them. They're sort of really having a, a crisis I don't know, of conscience or a crisis of what they're supposed to be doing and what their role is in, uh, in this whole free speech uh, uh, dialogue. Um, so some people have wondered whether, in the, uh, does the United States need a First Amendment 2.0? Uh, 
right? Given the prevalence and all of these issues that relate to uh, free speech and the First Amendment. Um, a couple of recent stories that, are, that have been out there um, that, again, another one about free speech. These issues are in the news all the time, and they're going to continue to be in the news or cases in the federal courts or cases that are coming to the Supreme Court. You know, again, in, in wake of the Supreme Court's decision on Roe versus Wade, you know, the question arises whether states that have very restrictive abortion statutes or outright ban abortion in their states will seek to regulate um, advertisements um, available to their population about uh, abortion or abortion providers or medications and things of that nature, because they, they seem to be very, um, I don't want to say aggressive, but very, uh, very interested in trying to uh, reduce the incidence of abortion you know, in their state. So there's some concern that uh, those, those state governments are going to enter into the digital world, that arena, to restrict free speech of businesses or others, um, advertisers, public interest groups, pro-life groups, who want to talk about accessibility to abortion somewhere outside of the state or be able to get abortion in your own home kind of thing. Um, you know, the Dominion defamation suit that's uh, pending against Fox News and many other people continues to grind its way through the court system. You know, Rudy Giuliani has filed a uh, counterclaim uh, saying that, you know, the, that lawsuit is infringing upon his uh, free speech rights, you know, his First Amendment rights. Um, Florida. Um, has enacted a number of provisions relating to speech issues, right? The so-called don't say gay statute, where they are prohibiting certain types of speech in elementary schools involving kids regarding gender related issues. Um, that's, uh, that's, and um, the, there's another statute that is in Florida right now that is intended to prevent social media companies from removing politicians you know, from their platform sort of in response to Twitter banning, you know, Donald Trump. Um, so those, those issues are out there. We recently had a free speech issue at Georgetown University. One of their professors uh, was suspended after he uh, sent a tweet that was, made a negative comment about the, the president um, and his uh, recent Supreme Court nominee. And um, that got uh, Georgetown in some hot water and was ra rather notorious. That professor ultimately simply resigned rather than agree to be reinstated. So these are First Amendment um, issues that relate directly to the digital world that we're in. And um, they're gonna continue to be uh, coming up into the courts. It's going to be something that'll be on the front burner of a lot of conversations you know, on a going forward basis. So, um, Again, coming back to this idea that some people think that maybe we need a First Amendment 2.0 to address these, uh, these issues in light of all the, the digital world that we're in. Um, but others might say, well, the answer is already here and the answer is blockchain, right? And that blockchain, which is the technology that serves as the basis for cryptocurrency, blockchain allows people to circumvent these restrictions and communicate rather freely. So that might blow your mind a little bit. And if it does, um, uh, you're not, you're in good company, you're in company. Because, you know, before I put this presentation together, you know, I sort of had to ask myself this question, seriously, what the hell is blockchain? Uh, I've certainly heard lots of articles about it. Um, lots of people talk about it. Some of my friends talk about it. I have a, a good attorney friend who um, practices law as it relates to this area. And I think my eyes have gotten glazed over uh, several times over a couple of drinks while he was talking to me about it. I am sad to say, but um, it is definitely something that if we don't understand it now, we're going to have to understand it. And I think that this is going to be um, uh, becoming more prevalent, not just for the, the cryptocurrency, but uh, I think you'll come to understand how First Amendment connects to it as well. So let's talk a little bit about blockchain. So blockchain is a form, is a kind of a database, right? And more specifically, it's a distributed database. 
So the kind of database that we might all be interested, we might all understand, right, is uh, that, you know, we've got a computer server in our offices or in our home, and the, the server or our computer at home has a database or a repository of all of our digital files that we store it in. Maybe you store your stuff on your laptop in My Documents. That's a database, right, of documents on your computer. Or maybe you save them in some type of a shared drive on your server at work. Or perhaps you save your documents or your digital files into a shared drive in the cloud, right? If you have SharePoint or Google Drive, you know, those are all databases um, where you can share information. But those databases um, all share uh, one basic um, commonality, which is they are a central repository, right? It's in one place. So it's on one laptop. It's in one server uh, folder on that piece of hardware that is in your office, or it's in one folder um, being hosted by whoever your cloud provider is. Blockchain is different than that. It's a distributed database, meaning um, it is really a, a connection of little databases that are decentralized and stored in servers separated by locations or nodes, right? Instead of one central location. So there's a little bit of it on in lots of different places all over the internet. Um, so this way, if one location has a malfunction or is hacked or is shut down, the other nodes in different locations can continue running to maintain that distributed database. So if you cut one part of the one toe off, the rest of the toes keep doing the job, so to speak. And so the data that is stored on the blockchain, this uh, distributed database, right? The data that's stored on the blockchain are cryptocurrency transactions, right? And so everyone has heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency. Um, so it's their blockchain, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain. Um, and not all cryptocurrencies are kept on the same blockchain. Um, theirs is a the type of distributed bit database that stores Bitcoin transactions. And so blockchain is kept universally. It's immutable. It really can't be altered by a third party. Um, it is, and that is unlike a centralized database that is run by a company or by a government that can be controlled by a company or government. It's, it's decentralized. Let's talk about look at the next slide. So how is blockchain connected to the First Amendment? They seem like they're two totally separate and incongruous things to be thinking about at the same time, but I'm going to try to fetch you around here and help you understand a little bit about that. And the first uh, way to understand this is to say, you know, money is speech. So money is speech is a, is a doctrine derived from a series of high profile Supreme Court cases here in the United States. And we have two of these cases, Buckley versus Vallejo, a 1976 Supreme Court case that established the controversial idea that spending money um, for a political campaign is a form of speech that is protected by the First Amendment. And then a more recent case, which many of us are familiar with and perhaps disappointed in, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, where the uh, was the latest iteration of this uh, money is speech doctrine. So money is free speech, right? You can spend money to say things that you wanna do, right? So when the government controls the money that you spend to communicate, it really can control the quantity, quality, and the topics of speech that can be heard uh, in, a, in a public arena. So if the government can control the manner in which you spend your money, in many ways it has control over speech, you know, in some ways. Uh, blockchain technology, which underpins uh, cryptocurrency, is infinitely less susceptible to government interference, right? You, again, it's a distributed database. And so if one node is taken out or controlled or captured by a governmental entity, 
Um, the, the, the rest of the nodes that carry all of this distributed information continue to operate. So it's virtually impossible for, uh, for it to be uh, interfered with. So if a government blacklists the financial transactions of an individual, um, we see this happening, we've seen this in the United States, that they are blacklisting or, or uh, putting these censures on certain individuals in the Russian government, just as a, by way of example, um, trying to block their ability to spend money, to transact money, to do these types of things, right? Um, that's really what they're trying to do in, in some respect is stop their free speech, right? Stop their ability to use money as a form of speech to get whatever their message is out. Um, so cryptocurrencies are a way for that effective citizen to store their wealth and transact business with others in an alternative financial system that governments really have no ability to impact or control. So theoretically, uh, once cryptocurrency or crypto technology uh, becomes ubiquitous, governments will have effectively lost the ability to threaten wealth control uh, and financial you know, exclusion. So while um, now, what does this have to do with speech necessarily? Because I think we both we all understand the concept that you know speech, that money, being able to spend money to get your message out is a form of speech. You know, spending money, donating it to a candidate is your way of saying I support this candidate. Right? It's, it's a form of speech. Right? That's that's one way of doing it. Um, but how is more blockchain uh, even more connected to speech? Well. Blockchains are usually used to record cryptocurrency transactions. Um, the decentralized database underpinning the network provides uh, other ways to shepherd messages and avoid censorship or surveillance. So it's not just a record of financial transactions with a debit and a credit or something on your account. Blockchain provides individuals with the ability to air grievances on a protected platform without fear of censorship. Um, blockchain can, uh, the, the, you can attach little messages to these financial transactions and those uh, little messages that are attached to the transactions can be conveyed using this blockchain technology. So let me tell you a story to give you a, an idea of how this works. And it's a story about uh, Gao Yan and the Me Too movement in uh, China. And so online activists in China um, employed blockchain technology to ensure that an open letter asking for answers about a decades old rape and suicide case was undeletable from China's tightly controlled um, internet. And so there were these allegations that uh, Gao Yan, who was a student at Peking University, had been raped by one of her professors and she ultimately committed suicide. And as you might imagine in the Chinese society, um, there really wasn't a lot of investigation into this type of a thing, but these activists really wanted to raise awareness about this terrible tragedy and, tragedy and who they thought was responsible. So eight students from the university lodged what amounts to a freedom of information request with, with Peking University, asking for information about the handling of its investigation of this um, old uh, alleged rape against the professor, Sheng Yang, um, who later committed suicide. And um, publicly, Peking University issued a statement saying, that, hey, we, we think that this is super important. You know, we're gonna conduct an investigation and uh, we think this is a big issue for us. But privately, what really happened was the university ramped up pressure against these activist students, um, sent, uh, sending them home from the university, suspending them from the university, threatening to prevent them from graduating um, and threatening ultimately their uh, careers. And any type of tweets and posts and other communications on social media and in the internet in China were deleted by the government there, right? They censored, they censored all of this stuff to sort of nip it in the bud. Well, these Me Too uh, activists 
uh, were very creative and they turned to blockchain to ensure that their message was visible uh, to uh, all of China and all of its internet users. And so an anonymous blockchain user stamped her account of the incident into the Ethereum blockchain uh, and meaning that it can never be erased. So she attached this message to a transaction of Ethereum cryptocurrency so that anybody could see it. it was immutably put onto the Ethereum blockchain. Very creative way of doing that. And the government could do nothing about it because the blockchain is immutable, right? They can't censor it, they can't stop anybody from seeing it. So pretty amazing way that that happens. So let's switch gears back a little bit to talking about digital assets and a digital estate plan. And I want to talk a little bit about why um, it's so important for you and your family to make sure that you've um, included a digital, the digital assets into your estate plan. And long and short, your family could lose big money if you don't pay attention to your digital assets whenever you're putting together a digital plan or advising your clients to do that. And we're going to talk about all of these things. You know, digital wallets for cryptocurrency don't have account names or titles. That's something that if you don't know anything about cryptocurrency, you might not have realized, but um, they don't have account names or titles. So there is information that you have that you can access it. Um, but if you're the only one who knows about it, um, that's going to be a big problem for your family if you want them to be able to access your cryptocurrency wealth. Um, crypto is not registered with any, or digital assets aren't really registered necessarily with any banks or financial institutions. Some of them are. I mean, you have financial accounts. Many of us probably have financial accounts that are only online. And those are registered with banks and financial institutions. But many of our digital assets are not registered that way. Um, access to digital wallets are controlled by private key. So uh, digital wallets, meaning virtual wallets for cryptocurrency. You have to have this private key. It's like a code. And without the key, um, the, the virtual wallet containing your cryptocurrency is totally useless. And in the crypto world, there is no um, change password option that you can get. There's no 1-800 number that you can call. Um, there's no recourse against the, any digital currency exchange to recover a lost key. There's really... Uh, no safety net when it comes to crypto. If you've lost your digital key, um, you are uh, screwed. Um, so sudden death or incapacity without proper planning can render your uh, digital assets totally worthless. If you can't access it, it isn't worth anything, right? At the end of the day, it just isn't worth anything. That's basically what it is. And so my message to you is don't be a digital dummy and I'm going to talk to you about this digital dog, Matthew Mellon, and uh, who lost 500 million in cryptocurrency. You might recognize the name Mellon. Um, he is a direct descendant of the founder of Mellon Bank and also of Drexel, of Drexel Burnham Lambert. So he had a well-heeled history in the financial world. And he was an early investor in certain types of cryptocurrency. Um, the problem for him was that he died unexpectedly at 54 years old. Uh, I can certainly relate to that, uh, not the death part, but the age. And unfortunately, he stored his private keys in what are referred to as cold wallets, right? Meaning it was written down somewhere and put somewhere. And uh, he distributed those in various banks across the country. And he never told anyone which banks and where the wallets were stored or what the private keys were. So as of 2022, uh, there have been no reports of his digital wallets or keys ever having been located. So his $500 million of cryptocurrency is worth zero, right? Zero, because he did not plan appropriately for those digital uh, assets. So let's talk a little bit about why you or your clients uh, might also want to create a digital asset plan. Um, in addition to the fact that your family, your families or your clients' families could lose a ton of money. Um, another reason is to main, maintain privacy. And, you know, the desire to, main, main, uh, to have some type of privacy is nothing new, right? Uh, some people want to do trusts because they don't want to go through the probate process. And there is some privacy benefit to having a trust 
to stay out of the public uh, courts. Um, and that's been something that's as old as our country. And here's George and Martha Washington. Um, they engage in a colonial form of digital estate planning. Um, after George's death, it's thought that Martha burned the majority of her written correspondences over the course of her marriage with George. Um, they wanted to maintain privacy. They didn't want anybody to know anything about those files and what they said you know, about themselves. They wanted to maintain that privacy um, in their relationship. So that is uh, one reason why folks might want to have um, some privacy. Now, they may also want to have privacy because their digital files contain things that are either illegal, embarrassing, or secret that they want to keep secret. So it is not uh, that uncommon, I guess, that someone might have something on their computer that is illegal. Uh, so there are incidents of child pornography and almost invariably um, those files are located on somebody's computer or their hard drive. And so maybe um, you or your clients have something on your computer that if it were found by the police may cause you some type of uh, problems. You might have things on your computer that are embarrassing or in your digital files that are, embar that are embarrassing. You know, could you put it in plain sight for your family to see? If not, then you might have some things on your in your computer or in your your digital files that uh, you wouldn't really want somebody to see. And that means that you have to do some managing of that so that uh, it maintains being it continues to be private after you pass away. And you might also have some things that you want to just keep secret for whatever reason. You know, maybe it's information, it's affiliations, relationships. Um, that you wouldn't want to become known to your family or your friends or the general population. So uh, these things may be in your digital files and uh, you might want to take care of those. Now you may also want to control your online reputation and persona. You may be the, want to be the one who controls that after you pass away because if you're on social media, you have an online reputation. You have an online persona. You probably have an online reputation, whether you want it or not. Um, there are services out there, especially for attorneys like AVO or others that are going to put a profile out there about you and invite people to rate you. Um, Google, people may be Google rating you uh, online. You didn't ask for that necessarily, but you have an account out there. So you have an online reputation and an online persona. That's just the world that we live in. Um, but you may want to take some type of con post-mortem control of that. And here's another lesson to be learned. Uh, Herman Cain, uh, high profile, uh, former Republican presidential candidate, passed away during the COVID pandemic. And uh, surprisingly, after he passed away, continued to denounce Democratic politicians on his social media accounts two weeks after he, he died. And I've included some of his posthumous posts. Um, now, one might wonder how in the world did, did it happen that Herman passed away and he continued to post on his social media? Well, I'll tell you. Um, it's because his kids took control of his social media. They had access to them and they just decided to continue saying whatever their father was saying. At least what they thought that he was going to say you know, after he passed away. Now, depending on your relationship with your kids, that could be, you know, something you're not too worried about, or it could be something that you're really worried about. You know, is it going to be a mommy dearest type of, uh, of uh, take control of your social media accounts after you pass away? I don't know. You know, you might, you might want to wonder about that kind of a thing and, and just say, I'm going to control whatever my online uh, presence is or persona is after I pass away. Maybe that's, I'm going to get rid of the presence altogether, or maybe it means that you're going to put something out there that you want everybody to see to remember you by, because of course the internet is forever, right? You're going to be on there forever. So maybe the most important um, reason to, um, for yourself and to encourage your clients to include digital assets in their estate plan is to give them a greater peace of mind. Um, and there are a lot of aspects to this. One of which is that there are a lot of um, dead, there are a lot of Facebook accounts and other social media accounts 
that are associated with people who have deceased, right? Right now, there are up to 30 million uh, Facebook accounts that are associated with dead people. And about 8,000 die on a daily basis. And uh, before too long, it's estimated that Facebook will have as many accounts associated with people that are alive as people are dead, right? And I've certainly heard and talked to people who see Facebook accounts um, of people who have passed away. And that whenever they come up in their feed and their own social media accounts, sometimes that can be a not, a not a happy reminder, not a happy reminder. Or maybe the posts that are on this, the person's account that has passed away aren't necessarily the happiest or kindest or nicest or the most complimentary of them um, that, uh, that really are just not a way that you would want somebody to be remembered. So some other great reasons why you want want to include your digital assets in your digital estate plan. Um, it's really important for you to identify um, your assets for your, your agent on a, on a power of attorney during your lifetime um, or your executor after you pass away. Um, if, if, you don't, if they don't know that you have these assets, there's, they really can't do anything about them, right? And this is something that, at least in my personal practice, I'm seeing more and more. As people... Uh, get rid of their paper statements and are going to all online accounts and, and all online statements, um, you know, that stuff is not known anymore unless they tell people. And I'm, there are very few people who put a list of their assets together and share them with their kids. These are all the accounts that I have. Here's all my account numbers. You know, it's the rare individual that does that kind of stuff. It's a good organizational thing, but you know, quite frankly, in a lot of families, the dynamic is such that it's probably not a good idea to share that information. It wouldn't necessarily be the best thing to do. And some people are just not comfortable doing that because it's their money and they're, a lot of people are hinky about their money, right? That's just all there is to it. Um, and, you know, I'm getting more and more estates that I'm opening where somebody comes in and doesn't have a tremendous amount of confidence that uh, what, you know, when I ask them what assets the deceased have, they're not quite sure. You know, they might say, well, he or she had, I know they had online accounts, but all I could find were a couple of checkbooks. I'm not sure whether that's everything or not. So it's, it's a real problem. Um, next to knowing what assets you have, um, you need to be able to give access to your digital and online assets to your agent and your executor. You know, your agent under a power of attorney is there to help you manage your finances, but you have to equip them with the ability to do that. And giving them a piece of paper that says it's a power of attorney is a great start, right? But if that's all you give them and the rest of their job is a Perry Mason deal to go try to figure out where all of your assets are and then also work with or wrangle with financial institutions to get access to your accounts, you know, that could be a tremendously devastating situation for you financially um, if this money is needed to pay for your medical expenses or to support your family, and there they don't, you know, your agent doesn't need to be spending an enormous amount of time and energy figuring out what you have and then getting access to it. Uh, that's the last thing that you want them to have to do, really. And it makes their job all that much harder, right? I mean, it's hard enough to be a personal representative under a power of attorney or to be an executive to sort of marshal all of those assets. You know, it's one thing to, you know, look for your paper account statements in your desk at your house or wait for the mail for a month until you get all the statements in the mail. That's relatively simple. Uh, but if you're not getting paper statements and you don't have them around, then, you know, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to assist you or to administer a state. Um, not, uh, not, having all of this stuff put together um, really uh, works against facilitating the administration of your estate. It's gonna increase the cost and frustration of administering your estate. And it also puts your assets at risk from identity theft, from hacking, from fraud. You know, the incidents of post-mortem identity theft are dramatically increasing. And uh, people are getting access to your accounts there are stories that have occurred uh, where identity thieves get access to a deceased person's online account, steal the money, 
and nobody knows about it because nobody knows about the account. And so the online thieves or the identity thieves are getting away with this money, robbing these accounts and not gonna get caught because it's gonna take a long time for somebody to figure out what happened if somebody can figure it out you know, at all. So let's talk a little bit about a digital estate um, plan and it starts with creating an inventory. So I really encourage you or I encourage you to tell your clients that they need to create a list of all of their online accounts, their devices, their apps, uh, anywhere that their digital assets are stored. So devices or in the cloud or wherever it is. And they need to write down uh, a wide variety of information about, uh, about those things. So not only have the account, um, um, name of the account, where it is, like my Facebook account, my Netflix account, my uh, Rapid Rewards account, my online account with um, Key Bank or PNC Bank or Bank America, whatever it is, but they should write down their account number, their username, password, PIN numbers, security questions, you know, all of those things. Uh, Two-factor uh, security also makes that exponentially even more difficult. Um, so they probably would want to also want to include, you know, if there is two-factor authentication and where that factor goes, whether it's the email or uh, mobile phone kind of thing. So if if this hasn't been taken care of. I mean, there are a lot of states that have enacted laws uh, specifically addressing access to certain types of, of digital accounts. And uh, 46 have adopted out of the, um, the Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act or the revised version you know, of that act. And so that act does give agents under powers of attorney and, and administrators of the states, personal representatives, some important tools to solve problems presented by the increasing number of digital assets we own. But you have to give your agents and your personal representatives the ability to use these tools. Relying upon these acts alone is really not nearly enough uh, to, to truly incorporate digital assets you know, into your estate. So under the revised act, the extent to which a fiduciary can access the digital assets of a decedent is dictated by uh, a, a number of set of terms in descending authority. Um, they can create an online tool separate from their terms of service through which users can determine the extent of which their digital assets are revealed to third parties, including fiduciaries. So if a user has provided direction through an online tool, it will supersede conflicting directives including you know, a will. So the average person has 80 apps or online accounts. It would be very time consuming to interact with each and every app creator or online account to provide instructions to your fiduciary. And so, for example, social media or Facebook will give you, you know, it has a tool that says this, you can designate what happens with this account or who has access to it. You know, a lot of these, I don't want to say a lot, but uh, many of these online account providers or uh, hosts will, will allow you to do that kind of thing. Think of it as sort of a beneficiary form for that online account or a, sp a specific limited power of attorney for that account that dictates either who can access it or what happens to it after you pass away. But if you have 80 different apps, I mean, that's 80 different things that you got to go in, A, figure out whether that tool is even available from that vendor, and then B, what, what they give you, figure it out, and, and what they're gonna allow you to do, and then make decisions on that. That's a very, very time-consuming process, not only for you to do, but then also for your agent or your personal representative after death to go into each one of these places to figure all of that stuff out. If you go to my website at fificlaw.com um, and go to the estate administrate estate planning and trust page, there is a section on digital uh, asset planning and you can access a guide to all of, many of the most popular 
online account vendors like Facebook, Netflix, and LinkedIn and all of that. And um, uh, that guide will tell you what kind of things they have available for direction for you, for customers. Uh, that we do update that periodically. Now, you can also um, use a will, trust, or power of attorney to authorize access to these assets after death. Um, this is really a good way, a very good way to plan for access and distribution of digital assets, kind of a one-stop shop where you designate um, somebody to access these things and you tell them what their powers are. And I think you'll find that in wills or trusts, whatever the estate planning vehicle is that you're using for your clients out there, um, the person who is going to be the executor of the estate may not necessarily be the, the person who would, you would want to handle the digital assets. Um, just different, maybe different capabilities, different understanding of what's going on, a level of comfort in dealing with these digital accounts and digital assets. And so you might find yourself suggesting to your clients that they have you know, one person to be the personal representative in the more traditional sense of the word, but then they name something, somebody completely different to facilitate the um, handling of these digital assets and where appropriate transfer of fine money out of those accounts to the more traditional you know, executor. But you know, the job of a digital executor is really beyond handling money, right? Because you may want this person to do a variety of functions with your digital accounts after you pass away. For example, your Facebook account isn't going to necessarily have any money associated with it, but you may want to give your digital executor instructions on what to do with that account. And maybe it's to take everything down or close it out, or maybe it's to post an in memoriam there. You know, that's just one example of the role that a digital executor can have for you. Um, you might want them to access your email clients, your email accounts, your Gmail account, let's just say, and clear all of the email, just delete it all, right? And then also put up an autoresponder that says you've passed away. Um, and here's how you get more information about you or your, you know, here's where to direct inquiries, you know, those types of things. So um, you, know, you, can, you may find that you have uh, some different hats out there. Um, if the user hasn't provided direction for the disposition of the digital assets, then the custodian's terms of service um, are, are going to apply. And if the terms of service do not include cover the issue, the act's default rules apply. And um, the default rules recognize multiple types of digital assets. This is basically the same as doing nothing, right? Or dying without a will. Um, and relying upon the law of intestate succession to get it right for your family. And of course, the, the laws of intestate succession in many states were written in the 19th century. And uh, families, as we now define that term in 2022, are wildly different than they might have been defined in the 19th century. And uh, the 19th century laws of intestate succession oftentimes have not been updated since then. Uh, don't take into account the very different types of family situations that we have today. And so relying upon this act as sort of the, the, the plan for your digital assets is really like doing nothing. You're outsourcing your digital asset plan to the government, right? Or to the app companies. And this is gonna, I think you'll find very often, not very helpful at all, to the decedent's uh, family. So for certain types of digital assets like virtual currency, the act gives the fiduciaries unrestricted access. But for other types of assets, such as electronic communications, the statute doesn't provide fiduciaries with access at all. And it may only allow them to um, access metadata. And so they might not be able to enter into your email accounts or other types of communication accounts and do anything with them. So um, it's best to make sure that your clients understand uh, what this act does, what powers this act does provide to personal representatives and what it does not. 
But at the end of the day, the message that I think is most important is uh, don't leave it to the government to dictate what happens to your assets or what control or direction they're going to give to your financial representatives. This is really an opportunity for everybody to define how they want to have their digital assets managed after they pass away. And it's uh, not advisable to uh, give that up to the government, right? Because, of course, everybody trusts the government, right? And they think that they're going to get it just right for their family. So it's uh, that's silly, of course, to think to say. Trusting government is at an all-time low these days. And, you know, if you ever want to convince a client to the wisdom of uh, getting a will done or, or handling any other types of, of estate, you know, I always tell them, hey, don't worry. You know, if you pass away without a will, the government's going to take care of your family. They know exactly how to, exactly what you would do, right? Your whole life you've worked to amass whatever assets it is that you have. And you want to leave it to the people who are the most important to you in the entire world. And so, of course, it's a great idea to uh, give up your right to plan for that and just allow the government to do it for you. Ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous that you say. And so the same thing applies to digital assets. And we just have so many digital assets. People really have to come to grips with the fact that they need to uh, plan for their digital assets in their estate planning. It's gonna it makes it's gonna make it harder in many respects, right? Many, harder in many respects. But it's uh, gonna be vitally important to be talking to your clients about what digital assets they have and why it's so important for them to be thinking about them when it comes to estate planning. So I have a coda um, on that Blue Ink memoir. So Bernstein apparently decided to encrypt uh, his work in progress draft memoir on his laptop. And as you might have guessed, he didn't tell anybody what the password was. And so he died in 1990, about two years after he started his Blue Ink memoir. And um, uh, it's gone. It's, it, nobody's ever been able to access it ever since. And so his memoir is now lost. You know, that fantastic, famous uh, composer that everybody's, the name everybody remembers is now lost. And unfortunately for him, um, he did have one of those sort of mommy dearest family situations where his daughter uh, subsequently wrote a rather unflattering um, biography about her father. And uh, that's really the legacy that was left. And he lost the opportunity to define his own legacy through his own memoir. So that's what I have for you about uh, digital estate planning and, um, and, and cryptocurrency and, and its connection to the First Amendment. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. If you, you certainly are welcome to go to my website at fificlaw.com. Go to the estate and trust um, a page where you'll find a section on digital estate planning. And you will be able to download, if you would like, um, a digital inventory or digital asset inventory. And we could even uh, share with you a digital asset instruction letter that is not only inventories all of the digital assets, but also gives somebody the opportunity to explain to their personal representative or their digital executor what they want to have done with those digital assets after they pass away. Now, that's something that everybody can do. There are a lot of apps out there, and they might have a lot of digital assets. Maybe they include only some of them in the digital asset um, instruction letter, but maybe they include all of them. There are also online solutions out there where you can uh, purchase a service, either monthly or a one-time fee, uh, where you can include all of your digital asset inventory in there and some instructions on what you want to have done. And some of those services will actually, after you pass away, uh, once they're notified that you pass away and it's verified that you passed away, they will provide all of this information and access to whoever it is that you designate as your digital executor. And those services may also actually effectuate some portions of your digital estate plan. Um, they can go into your phone and wipe it clean. They can go into your email accounts, wipe it clean and post a message on there. They can access your um, social media accounts and do whatever it is that you want with them. So there are technology solutions 
that are very, very reasonably priced that can handle these things uh, for folks if they are so inclined to do that rather than do it mechanically and on their own. And we've partnered with a company called Final Security. You'll see a link uh, for their information on my website. Um, if you want to take a look at that product that they have, but um, it is a, it's a technology solution to this um, problem of digital estate planning. So I hope you'd enjoy the presentation and um, feel free to contact me with any questions. You can reach me at mfifik at fificlaw.com. Thank you.